Welcome to Uncovered in the Archives. I'm your host, Brad Pomerantz. On today's episode, we're heading to Asperia. And that phrase is much more than just a catchy cliche. Those three alliterative words became the title of a song that took the nation by storm and led to a mid-century population boom that transformed this high desert community from a sleepy town into the second largest city in the Victor Valley. Had that happen? Find out on this edition of Uncovered in the Archives. Uncovered in the Archives is made possible in part by Loma Linda University Health. Additional support provided by Coachella Valley Water District, City of Riverside, County of Riverside, City of Hesperia, Steve Tobin and the Grace Helen Spearman Charitable Foundation, City of La Quinta, and by contributions to your PBS stations by viewers like you. Thank you. Chris Riley, good to see you. you doing, I'm Brad? glad you're here. Chris is local historian here in Hesperia. He's the author of this book, very informative, beautiful imagery in it. I learned in the book, in 1885, the town was founded, is that a fair way to Correct, say it? Correct, by Robert McClay Whitney. But something happened two years earlier. What was that? This schoolhouse was built. So this building that we're in right now, built in 1883, the first schoolhouse of Hesperia. Yes. What's amazing to me, Grizz, about you is you are the collector of all imagery of Hesperia since the beginning of time, <laughs> in memoria. And you found a picture of school children outside from 1890? Correct. Yeah, you are a wealth of information and I'm so glad to have met you. I did notice though in that picture, Grizz, that there's a beautiful large bell on the top yes. of this building. Yes. But when I was outside, there's no bell there. No, there isn't. Uh, that had to come down in the late 20s, early 30s because of an earthquake and sat alongside here okay. until almost the 50s. And I actually drove by a school in coming in here and I saw what I thought was a bell that looked pretty old. I think the school was Joshua Circle, okay. And so is that the bell that was on the top? Yes, it is. How did it wind up there? Well, in about uh, 1957, they had a contest. They won it, so they transported the bell for historic purposes and put it at Joshua Circle. What an amazing And it's gift. been on display since then. Yeah, what a gift for those students. Now, I presume that where we are today, the original schoolhouse, it's not operating as a schoolhouse, is that right? No, it's not. But it transitioned from a place of educational learning to biblical learning. Nice. And it has been a church ever since. Around the same time, Grizz, that the school was built, there was a hotel that was built called the Hesperia Hotel. Tell us about it. Yes, uh, after Hesperia was founded by Robert McClay Whitney, the next two and a half years, the Hesperia Hotel was built out on Hesperia Road. He looked at it as far as this being the first place people saw when they came up on the high desert and the last place they saw. So he envisioned this hotel as being a, a beautiful resting spot. And I have to tell you, from what I read in your book, this was quite a modern marvel. For the late 1800s, it was practically a skyscraper. Three floors, uh, had running water, restrooms, communications between floors. Yes. I mean, this was way ahead of its time for 1887, 1890s. There wasn't anything like it, size-wise or otherwise, until the 1920s. I want to ask about the success of the Hesperia Hotel, because it really was a crown jewel for the region in that era. Why was the hotel so successful? When the railroad came through, uh, it was the first place they hit or stopped hitting the high desert and the last place before they left. Right, I wanna reference something else you showed me from your archive. And it comes from a map from the good old AAA. 
Oh, yeah. The <laughs> Automobile Club of America. Yes. They put out a map, I think it was in 1912, yes. is that right? And what did that map show? Well, AAA started pushing National Trails uh, Highway back in 1912 as a means of travel. Right. And all the maps up until 1923 showed the old John Brown Trail coming by the Hesperia Hotel and listing it as a place to stop. So literally, if you were driving, let's say, from Los Angeles to Vegas, the natural place to stop would be the Hesperia Hotel. It was right on that map. I mean, it was the gold standard in terms yes. of where to stay. Yes. And then I recall reading in your book that someone pretty darn famous came through. Paderewski. Yeah, who was he? He was a world famous uh, pianist. And what happened is there was a wreck on the Cajon. So they got to stay at the Hesperia Hotel. And this gentleman, Ignacy Paderewski? Yes, sir. He became the prime minister of Poland. But you mentioned 1923, and that was a pivotal year for the hotel, for Hesperia, for the region. What happened? Well, Route 66 started coming into development. So between 23 and 26, we started to see the changes. By 1926, Route 66 officially was commissioned and opened and redirected the traffic totally away from the hotel. And so if you look at the trail map, from the mid-1920s, the Hesperia Hotel is not starred. It, it's not Correct. a place to stop. Correct. And that caused a massive drop in business. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's a metaphor for what happened to Hesperia in the 1930s, even into the 40s, yes. am I right? Yes, it kind of went into a dormancy. What we know is by 1960, the hotel had to be demolished. Correct. But the 1950s, those were very good years for Hesperia, transformative years. Yes. And I understand that you invited some friends who were around during that era to talk to us about it. Yes, I did. So can we go talk to them? You betcha. Okay, let's go talk to Jim Walker and George Stanford. We are joined now by Jim Walker. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Jim's family moved to Hesperia in the 1940s. And I want to get a sense, sir, how did your family wind up in Hesperia? Well, my daddy came out here in a freight train <laughs> in the late 30s, early 40s. Went to work for the Tatums down in the Paris Valley. OK. The Tatums moved up here. And my daddy so impressed them that he came up there here with them as a full partner. And let's talk about the Tatums. I've seen that name in Grizz's book. They clearly are early pioneers of Hesperia. And in fact, Grizz found some early gunny sacks with Tatum produce on the actual label. You see potatoes, you see onions. That's what the Tatums and your daddy were producing in the 40s, is that right? Yes, they're just, we call them burlap sacks. And, okay. And, uh, we even found some pictures from the archives of the Tatums uh, on the fields. We found another photograph in the archives. It's very sweet. In the late 1940s, I think you're in it. Actually, the building that we're in right here. That is remarkable. So we're in the actual original schoolhouse right now, and this is a picture of your class in front of it. Fantastic. And that's me right there. I love it. Oh, just terrific. I want to talk more about the Tatums. They seem like they're pretty special people. Give me a sense of Mr. Clyde Tatum. Clyde Tatum was, was, had more vision than anyone I've ever known. Mm. He, uh, I admired him more almost than, than my daddy. Wow. When your mother moved out to Hesperia, your father came here first, when she got off the train, Clyde Tatum was there with something. Another good example of, of Clyde's caring. He, uh, my daddy said or that my mama had told him when she comes to California, she wants a new pair of shoes. That's, that's all she wants when she gets here is a okay. new pair of shoes. And sure enough, Clyde met her, Clyde met her with a pair of shoes. Excuse me. <laughs> Clearly, that moment, that memory touches you. Why? 
I don't know, we, uh, in, when I was a kid, it was, there wasn't much to it because uh, we always had everything we, need, we wanted, needed. We uh, never, never went very long without something that we, we needed bad. And uh, I never thought about the hardship that uh, my mom and daddy went through, but now as in later years, I look uh, back and, on those years and with more information, I, know what, I think about what the, what the depression years were like. After your mama arrived, she was wearing new shoes. There was a disease that was running through produce and that caused the Tatums and your father to decide to shift industries. I want to hear more about that. Yeah, that, as a matter of fact, we had a, a fungus attack potatoes at that point called scab spread through all, all the agricultural land we had at that time. So we had to, actually had to give up farming. They said, let's build houses. And then Scott himself a crew just started building houses as fast as he could go. So I read in Grizz's book that not only was Tatum working in construction, but another outfit known as the Stanford Construction Company. And I know that you know uh, George Stanford because you stole his girlfriend in high school, am I right? Where's that rumor? <laughs> I don't know, I just heard it somewhere. I think Grizz told me. Yes, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact I did. Okay, well. I gotta tell you how easy that was. <laughs> it was. It was laughable how easy it was. Guess what, George is here. And we're gonna to talk to George about his daddy and how his family got involved in construction like the Tatums. So let's go talk to George Stanford. We're now joined by George Stanford. Nice to meet you, sir. Thank you so much for Same joining here. us. I recently learned from Grizz that you are related to Leland Stanford, who was a governor of California in the 1800s. Yes, he was my great, great, great uncle and he built Stanford University. Okay, some good stock you've come from, yes. no doubt. I want to ask you about construction here in Hesperia. What about your family? What did they see in Hesperia when they moved here? Was it in the, what year did they move here? In 1954. Okay. People needed a good place to live at a reasonable price. And I actually found in the archives, thanks to Grizz, uh, some old magazines from Hesperia. It is clear that Hesperia was marketing to families. I mean, look, this magazine, this page is called Family of the Month. How about this? A full page spread, Hesperia at Home. This is from 1958. Yep. I mean, I know where Hesperia was looking to attract people, and that was in the family. Yes. And sir, I actually have a surprise for you. Oh. In an edition of Hesperia magazine, there is an article about your father. The article is entitled, Stanford Entertains. And apparently, the Harry Stanfords invited Hesperia residents to see their new home overlooking the golf course. Much food and other delicacies were served to the delight of all. Yes, there barbecues is. and everything. Do you remember that day, yeah, maybe? Oh yeah, I remember, it, sure. Okay, I want to speak more about construction in Hesperia because it was a gamble. There was another name that I saw in the magazines, and that was M. Penn Phillips. Yes. You can see he wrote pen lines in multiple yes. issues. Who was M. Penn Phillips? He was the uh, backbone of the whole valley here. So I know that your family worked with Mr. Phillips, as did the Tatums, as did mm -hmm. the Walkers, but the bottom line is you were taking a risk. You were hoping that folks would move out to Hesperia in the 50s. And so what I want to do, sir, is I want to invite back Grace Dryley, who's the local historian for Hesperia. There was something that happened in the 1950s that really transformed this city, this town. And Grace is going to tell us about it. We're going to have you back on the program in a little while. So let's go talk to Grace Dryley. Grace Dryley is back. Grace, there's no question that the Tatums the Walkers, the Phillips, they were taking a big risk when they started to build homes here in Hesperia in the 1950s. Something fortuitous happened though that benefited those three families. Yes. Tell me about a man who I read about in your book, F.X. McDonald. Well, F.X. Uh, actually came out of the LA area 
Well, somehow, FX hooked up with the Arthur Godfrey show in New York. Okay, that was 1950s American Idol. Right, exactly. Okay. And so FX traveled back there to New York, not thinking much of it, and performed a song called Heading for Hesperia. Okay, so tell me a bit about the song. Well, the song is sung to the tempo of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, so it's got kind of a bouncy type uh, sound to it. But the lyrics were written by FX's father. I was so compelled by that story when I read it in Grizz's book that I asked Grizz to invite two performers from Hesperia, Hesperia natives, to perform heading for Hesperia. So who'd you invite? Well, I think you're gonna be really thrilled. We got Charlie Ray, which is one of our local talent, TV and radio, as well as a musician. And then he's accompanied by Linda Washington, and they do a harmony that's unbelievable. That I think you're gonna be totally thrilled. I cannot wait. Let's go listen to Heading for Hesperia. Here we go. He was huffing and puffing, coming fast along the trail. With a snort and sneeze, he cut the breeze. His shirt tail was a sail. As he passed me by, I asked him why. He hollered, I can't hear you. But there's not a doubt I heard him shout. I'm headed for Hesperia, headed for Hesperia. I'm getting out of here. I'm leaving, no doubt, and headed for California's new frontier. Where there's no smog or smoke or noise and freedom from hysteria. I'm telling you, Mac, I'm balling the jack. I'm headed for Hesperia. Out where the people never die And that's no fabrication When death comes near They just begin to start rejuvenation It's a simple trick that never fails They work it in that area They open their mouth for one more gulp Of fresh air in Hesperia I'm headed for Hesperia I'm getting out of here I'm leaving no doubt and headed for California's new frontier Where there's no smog or smoke or noise And freedom from hysteria I'm telling you Mac, I'm balling the jack I'm headed for Hesperia out where common needs are handy Sold in the general store Like calico eggs and candy And the post office behind the door Out where the air is fresh and clean There is no smog or smoke Out where you're held in high esteem And, and the, the undertaker's broke, broke. Heading for Hesperia, I'm getting out of here. I'm leaving no doubt and heading for California's new frontier. Where there's no smog or smoke or noise and freedom from hysteria. I'm telling you, Mac, I'm ball of the jack, I'm heading for Hesperia. If you hire a psychiatrist who's treating your hysteria, jump off his couch and shout out loud, I'm heading for Hesperia. Then tell old Mac you won't be back. Now pack your sack and call a hack. Get off the rack and make the track. And on the way, be ballin' the jack. I'm heading for Hesperia. I'm getting out of here. I'm leaving no doubt and headed for California's new frontier. Where there's no smoke, no, smoke. no noise. Freedom from hysteria. I'm telling you, Mac, I'm ballin' the jack. I'm headed for Hesperia. I'm headed for Hesperia. Chris, Charlie Ray and Linda, amazing. Yes, they are. I want to ask you, before Heading for Hesperia was sung on the Arthur Godfrey show, how many people lived in Hesperia? Oh, there was only like four to 500. After FX McDonald sung Heading for Hesperia on the Arthur Godfrey show in 1954, how many people wound up living in Hesperia? FX got back, that phone started ringing, and within four years, they were upward of about 4,000 landowners up here. So literally a tenfold increase merely because FX McDonald's song Heading for Hesperia on a national television show. Exactly. We lost FX. Yeah. Oh, a nice long life in 2013. There's no question that as a result of the explosion in residential properties here in Hesperia, there was a need for additional infrastructure. Oh, definitely. So uh, George Stanford's family heeded that call and decided to build that infrastructure. So why don't we go find out what they built and let's go talk to George Stanford. Welcome to Hesperia Airport. What a beautiful day. We are still with George Stanford. George, who constructed this airport? 
Uh, we we built it. We like yeah. the Stanford family. Yeah, our family. Yeah. Just built an airport. Why not? Yep. Right. Just as well. I want to ask about this plane, for example. Uh, I know it's from the 1940s, a World War II training plane, Army designation, PT-17. Planes like this would have landed at Hesperia Airport in the 50s. Yes, yes. Uh, let's talk more about what else was built at this airport, because your family didn't just build the airport. This is and was a destination. What else did you build here? Yeah, we built the restaurant and then the swimming pool. Swimming pool. I've seen that swimming pool, sir. It doesn't look like a swimming pool. It looks like an airplane. Uh, yes. Why did you build it in the shape of an airplane? Just so people would know that this was an airport. Uh, okay, I mean, why not? Yeah, oh yeah. So, restaurant, cocktail lounge, swimming pool, what else? And a motel. That motel, I read, was built in record time. Yeah, we built that in three weeks. Why? We had a big grand opening coming for a big golf tournament and a lot of movie stars and things coming. And George, I'm getting a sense that Hesperia was really becoming a destination yes. in the 50s. There's no question about it. Residential was exploding. We learned that. Golf was exploding. We found in Grizz's archives pictures of Arnold Palmer golfing here. Yes. Uh, Tommy Bolt, Charles Harper. I mean, yes. so many greats were coming. Your family worked with M. Pem Phillips. We know that. Yes. M. Pem Phillips decided that while this motel was important, he thought there was a need for even more hotels. Yes. What did he build? The Hesperia Inn. Let's talk about the Hesperia Inn because I have seen photographs in the archives of the Hesperia Inn, and that place was swanky. Oh, yes. I mean, gourmet food, gorgeous grounds, beautiful rooms, that pool. I mean, it would be glamorous today. Great music. There was dancing and mm -hmm. top entertainment. Yes. Tell me about that. Who came through? I tell you, probably every major entertainer was here at the Hesperia Inn. And I read, sir, that the Hesperia Inn became kind of a way station for entertainers on the way to Las Vegas. They try out their acts here. Yes. And to great benefit, you flew in one of those acts. Oh, Danny Thomas picked him up, brought him up here for the big party and everything. So you flew Danny Thomas from LAX to this airport yes. so he could perform at the Hesperia Yes, Inn. I did, yeah. I saw yes, Sammy Davis Jr. performed. Yes. Dorothy Dandridge, Mel Torme, Pinky Lee, the Marx Brothers. I found in the archives ads and mentions of the Hesperia Inn in Billboard magazine. This was for real. Mm -hmm. and this was real, some yeah, real stuff. George, there is no question that the Hesperia Inn was hopping in a payday. So I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you so very thank much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And I thought we'd bring back Grizz to talk to us about the fate of the Hesperia Inn and to learn about Hesperia in the 21st century. So let's bring back Grizz Dryley. Grizz, welcome back. Thanks so much. Thank you. I want to ask you a simple question. What happened to the Hesperia Inn? Well, by the mid 60s, it uh, went from the inn to the M. Penn Phillips Military Academy. And then it transitioned into a health club, exercise club with an Olympic pool. And by the mid 90s, it was sold and became the foremost healthcare, which mm. is kind of unique because foremost is actually built in the original configuration of the uh, Hesperia Inn. Wow. I want to ask you about today, about Hesperia in the 21st century. There's no doubt Hesperia is a special place. It's been your home for decades. Why do you love Hesperia? Why is Hesperia so special in the 21st century? Well, it still has its rural living. Hesperia Recreation and Park District has some of the best parks and uh, activities within the high desert. If you like just hiking, kind of nature or historical wise, we've got the Flume. It's a five mile walk. Grizz, I want to thank you so much. You have been so generous with your historical knowledge. This has been a remarkable journey. And I want you to consider this. Do you think that FX McDonald had any idea when he stepped onto the stage of the Arthur Godfrey show in 1954, that his rendition of Heading for Hesperia 
would literally inspire thousands of Americans to move to this high desert community, transforming it from a sleepy town into this striving metropolis, the second largest city in the Victor Valley. It's amazing. So I hope you enjoyed heading for Hesperia with us. I'm your host, Brad Pomerantz. Please join us next time to see what we uncovered in the archive. Uncovered in the Archives is made possible in part by Loma Linda University Health. Additional support provided by Coachella Valley Water District, City of Riverside, County of Riverside, City of Hesperia, Steve Tobin and the Grace Helen Spearman Charitable Foundation, City of La Quinta, and by contributions to your PBS stations by viewers like you. Thank you.